Oscar Suenes was a lacrosse city attorney from 1919 until 1935. Oscar grew up on the north side, not too far from the rail yard, and for some children of the era, the temptation to freight hop was too hard to fight, despite many warnings from their parents. Children would hop on the train cars as they left the rail yard and hitch rides around the area. When Oscar was 12, he was trying to hop on a train car when he slipped and fell, his right leg landing on the tracks. It was crushed and couldn't be saved, and a doctor had to amputate it just below the knee. Oscar wore a prosthetic leg for the rest of his life. This did not keep him from being active at school. He attended La Crosse High School, as it was known then, and was involved in debate clubs there. Oscar had worked as a clerk in the law office of Jesse Higby after graduating from high school. Higby was the city attorney at that time. After a few years as a clerk, Oscar attended law school in Madison and actually passed the state bar exam without completing his degree, something that wasn't allowed too much longer after Oscar did it. As Higby looked at stepping down from his role, he recommended Oscar for the position, as city attorney and the city council took his suggestion. In 1935, city attorney was a part-time role, allowing Oscar to run his own practice out of his office in the Rivoli building, while also serving as Onalaska city attorney. According to newspaper accounts, his particular area of interest was public utilities law, and he was on the board of public works. Oscar was given the nickname the $2,700 city attorney by H.E. Wheaton, the editor of a weekly newspaper in Hoka, Minnesota. The salaries of city officials had recently been published by the La Crosse Tribune, as they typically were when a budget was up for approval, and Wheaton made it apparent that he disagreed with the amount that Oscar Swenis was being paid. Wheaton often wrote his editorials in a blind item style without using the full names of those who he was writing about, so he would often refer to Oscar as the $2,700 city attorney. The irony was that Oscar's salary, which had been set in the 1934 budget, was only about $2,400, with a $300 allowance for a clerk. Irene Swenis was Oscar's wife of 13 years. She grew up in La Crosse, one of six children, and went on to graduate from the Wisconsin Business University, which had been located downtown. She worked as a stenographer for a few law firms and banks before setting up her own office in 1922 on the fourth floor of the Rivoli Building, across the hall from the law office of Higby and Swenis. In July of that year, Oscar and Irene were married in St. Paul. In the summer of 1935, Irene had taken a trip without Oscar that included visiting the Black Hills of South Dakota, Yellowstone National Park, and Estes Park in Colorado, a trip that at the time could have lasted a number of weeks. Irene had just returned from her trip on Wednesday, August 14, 1935. The evening of Wednesday, August 14, 1935, Oscar had a meeting with some officials from the U.S. Navigation Service. They met at the Hotel La Crosse, which was just across the street from the old courthouse. The meeting ran rather late into the night with Oscar leaving his car downtown and being dropped off at home at approximately 2.30 in the morning by the city street superintendent, who was also at the meeting. On Thursday morning, Oscar was expected at a meeting at 11 a.m. with the mayor and the city council. Oscar was supposed to speak at the meeting, so the council members waited 40 minutes, all while trying to determine where he was. Oscar's car had been left parked downtown the night before, which probably added to the confusion. It was the Swenis' next door neighbor, Bernice Stormont, that first noticed a smell of gas and determined that it was coming from the Swenis home. Mrs. Stormont was quoted in the La Crosse Tribune that she had first tried to reach Mrs. Swenis' family, but couldn't get hold of anyone. Her husband then called the police. When they arrived, it was reported that they could not get in through the door and instead cut a window screen to gain access. The bodies of Oscar and Irene were discovered inside. Irene was found dead in the kitchen near the open door of the oven. Oscar was found upstairs in their bedroom with a gunshot wound to his head. He was still alive, but unconscious, and police had him taken to Grandview Hospital, which was across the street. Police concluded that Irene had shot Oscar over what they had called domestic difficulties. Newspaper articles speculated that the domestic difficulty had to do with an issue of the Hokachief weekly paper that was found in the home. In that particular issue, Oscar was accused of leading a double life and meeting up with a woman who also worked in the Rivoli building. A note was left behind by Mrs. Swinnis, though it was originally written in July. The note was seen as a final will and testament because it only contained a few sentences in which Irene asks that all her possessions go to her sister. The envelope that it was in had been sealed, but on the outside of it, Irene made one final request, that she be buried next to Oscar. Oscar never regained consciousness and died from his injuries early in the morning of August 16, 1935. A double funeral was held the following Monday he and Irene were buried together, just as Irene had requested in her final note. 
We don't know why H.E. Wheaton targeted Oscar so often and so harshly, but the accusation he made in the July 11th issue of the Hoka Chief was severe. Without naming Oscar, Wheaton implied that he was seeing someone after hours who lived on 10th Street and who worked for the Lacrosse Theaters Company. On a Sunday morning in October, occupants of an apartment building on 10th Street reported smelling natural gas. It was coming from Ruth Bradfield's apartment. Police were able to break open the door, which had been taped shut from the inside. They found Ruth's body slumped in a chair in front of the open oven with the gas jets turned on. Ruth had been a secretary at the offices of the La Crosse Theaters Company in the Rivoli Building, the same building that Oscar had his office in. The report of her death was printed in several papers in the state, and some of them quoted close friends as saying that she had recently been distraught over the deaths of Oscar and Irene. We can only speculate how the general public may have felt about what they were reading in the newspaper, given the day and age. What we do know is that public offices were closed on the day of the funeral to allow city officials to attend, and a memorial resolution was read in tribute to Oscar at the city council meeting the following month. H.E. Wheaton was never charged with anything related to his article about Oscar Swenis, but he was sued for libel for many other articles that year. During sentencing, the judge scolded him harshly, and it's hard not to read into and apply it to the Swenis tragedy as well. H.E. Wheaton was fined that year for several libel cases against him. Though his paper was published out of Hoka, Wheaton and his family lived in La Crosse for a long time. Only two years after the events of 1935, Wheaton finally made a permanent move to Hoka. He died in 1954, shortly after selling his paper and seeing it merge with the La Crescent Times.